You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. John is joined today by Dr. Matt Kaplan. Dr. Matt Kaplan is a professor of physics at Illinois State University. He received his bachelor's from the University of Virginia and PhD from Indiana University. His thesis work was recognized with the 2018 Dissertation Award in Nuclear Physics from the American Physical Society. His research is broadly concerned with materials at high densities inside stellar remnants, such as crystals that form in white dwarfs and nuclear pastor phases in neutron stars. In addition, he works on nuclear weapons issues and was an inaugural fellow of the Physicists' Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction. Beyond academia, he is a writer for several YouTube channels, including Kurzgesagt, In a Nutshell, and PBS Space Time. Dr. Matt Kaplan, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. Now, we're going to have an interesting conversation today because we are going to talk about very, very strange states of matter, although they're not actually that strange because they happen. And then we're also going to talk about the strongest material in the universe, nuclear pasta. But before we do that, let's take a look at white dwarfs and what happens to matter when it begins to start becoming degenerate. Oh, that's a question. <laughs> okay. So, so do you know what the word degeneracy means? Should I unpack that? You can unpack it. Let's do that. Yeah, okay, so so degeneracy is is a word that we use to describe uh, particles filling states. And I mean states as in quantum states. A good analog is like an atom. The orbitals of an atom can be thought of as states, and the population of electrons that an atom has is distributed through these orbitals in some way. So degenerate matter is when all of the states up to some energy level are filled. So, for example, in an atom, it would be like filling the ground state and then your n equals 2, n equals 3, and then having nothing above it. So I'm starting with that because states in a white dwarf, for example, are completely different. You have states, instead of being confined to an atom, are distributed over the entire star. And you pack these electrons in and the wave functions end up being these very large, broad, extended wave functions. But because the pressure is so high, they fill up these states in the star. And so that's why we say this matter is degenerate. It's analogous to electrons packing into their lowest energy states in an atom, but it's it's fully ionized matter. And these electron wave functions are instead of filling a star instead of filling an atom. Now, what happens with, with all right, so white dwarf, you've got one, you know, a remnant, say the sun in however many billion years after it's red giant phase. So the sun's sitting there as a white dwarf cooling. What effect does heat have on the state of these atoms? I mean, does the heat actually create some kind of pressure? Yeah, that's a great question. So when you think of the sun, you think of something that's thermally supported. Every one of us sees these like animations of an ideal gas. When we're in school, you see like the billiard balls bouncing around on a pool table. The atoms, they bump into each other, they bounce off. This is what creates pressure in our atmosphere. This is what creates pressure in the sun. And the sun is 15 million Kelvin in its core. And so this is providing the thermal pressure. In that four or five billion years when the sun dies, it's going to contract. The thermal pressure is not going to be able to support it against gravity, but it is going to stop contracting at the point that the electrons become degenerate. So once the electrons are packed so close together that they're energies, just like energy levels in an atom, packs them to really high energies, that energy density is going to produce a pressure. This is one of the most fun facts I think I can tell anyone is that pressure and energy density have the same units. And so in astrophysics, it's the same thing. So in a white dwarf, the energy density of the electrons produces pressure that then I can say turns on in lieu of the thermal pressure and causes white dwarfs to have this characteristic size of about an Earth radius at a solar mass. Do they have layers? In other words, it is the outer edges of the crust, maybe you could use that word, although that's not quite... Not <laughs> sure, by, by analogy with the Earth, right? Yes, by analogy with the Earth. Do the white dwarfs have layers? I mean, is that, that degeneracy pressures and all that, do they change as you get deeper into the star? Yeah, this is a fantastic question, and, and I love this because 
this really dives into so much of modern astrophysics. In school, we show these pictures of here's a big round ball and this is a star. And they're just as complicated as the Earth in terms of their internal structure. So I want you to imagine the experience of a skydiver. Let's say Felix Baumgartner, if that's not too dated of a reference. Let's imagine jumping from space and falling down towards the Earth. What is that experience like? And I'm asking you, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you the answer. What is the experience like of jumping out of space? What do you see from the matter around you? Well, I would imagine if you were falling into a white dwarf, the immediate thing that comes to my head is increasing density. Exactly. As you pass down through the Earth's atmosphere or a star, whatever you want it to be, the density around you is increasing. You go from the vacuum of space to having a very sparse, wispy couple of atoms per cubic centimeter, but all of this gas is being compressed by the gas above it, and so you have a pressure and a density gradient as you go down in the atmosphere. So it's exactly the same as the Earth, exactly the same as the Sun, and the same thing is true in a white dwarf. The difference is where you end up. And in a white dwarf, you end up at these densities that are millions of times the density of any material on Earth within a few hundred kilometers. You're, you're in this, this bulk interior of degenerate matter that's, that's fully ionized. So as an astronomer, you might be concerned with this outer layer, the envelope, the opacity of this envelope, the, the metals that are present, meaning all of the heavy elements, determines how this, or this, this white dwarf can emit high energy photons. As you get deeper, you end up in this degenerate core, which is like a the, the electrons are degenerate and the nuclei are bouncing around, again, like billiard balls or an ideal gas. But as you approach the core, you encounter literal materials. The core is under such high pressures that the nuclei cannot actually slip past each other and they crystallize and they form this, this very dense solid that quite literally is a crystalline solid. A crystalline star. And that's one of the things I love about nature is that it sort of, you know, sometimes mimics itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can actually apply the word crystal to a white dwarf. Now, let me ask you this one. This is weird because it gets into the far future and the universe isn't old enough for this yet. As that white dwarf cools and begins to, you know, its long march to become a black dwarf, does that change this equation? Yeah, this is... Again, another very well-researched question. So the white dwarf does not have an energy source like our sun, for example. The white dwarf is only emitting the heat that was produced from the fusion reactions when it was still the active burning core of a star. So once that fusion shuts off, the outer layers are blown off and you have the white dwarf, they monotonically cool. So they cool off they slowly crystallize from the core outward, similar to how the Earth's core, inner core is crystallizing, and they give off this heat and their temperature decreases. So eventually, if you wait a bajillion years, and don't quote me on that, that's not a real number, I'm just giving big arbitrary number, uh, they will have gone fully black, they won't be emitting light anymore, they'll be in equilibrium with the cosmic background radiation, there'll be a fraction of a Kelvin, and they will be fully frozen solid and they will be stuck as this just giant crystal ball of carbon and oxygen or oxygen and neon forever, unless they are really, really close to the Chandra Shikhar mass. Then something interesting might happen. And that's where we're going next, the Chandra Shikhar limit. So degeneracy increasing with increasing mass, thus increasing gravity. And we start getting into a situation of a neutron star. What's the difference? What's that limit? So the, the Chandra Shekhar limit or the Chandra Shekhar mass, people use these interchangeably, but they are different, but they're referring to the same piece of physics. White dwarves and neutron stars, coincidentally, have this kind of funny property where if you add mass to them, they actually get smaller. So with terrestrial planets, if you look at Venus, Mercury, hell, we'll even add the moon in Mars, uh, you can rank them by radius and by size, and it, it like makes sense as the bigger ones are more massive. But because of how degenerate matter works, throwing more matter onto a white dwarf actually causes it to contract. You can think of it, it's, it's almost kind of like foam. It's like a foam ball that compresses. And in order to produce the pressure with the degenerate matter to support its weight against gravity, uh, it actually has to contract in order for the electrons to move to higher energies and produce higher pressure. So the more massive a white dwarf is, the smaller it is. And it turns out there's a limit, 1.4 times the mass of the sun, 
where this radius converges basically to zero and you cannot possibly squeeze it any tighter because it, it, it collapses in on itself. And so this is what's known as the Chandra Shakar limit or the mass that it happens at is the Chandra Shakar mass. And that intimately is that star trying to move towards a black hole. <laughs> it's trying, it's, it's contracting because of that increasing gravity that is overpowering the mass that it's made out of, you know, the matter that it actually is. Now, when you get into the neutron stars, how does that differ from a white dwarf and the layering and what happens? And again, we start getting into really strange materials here, the densest known stuff on in the universe. Yeah, you got it. So just to, to recap, I told you that the density of the core of a white dwarf is something like 100 million times the density of anything on Earth. So that's 10 to the 8 for those who like scientific notation. Uh, a neutron star is significantly more dense, and it's because this collapse that would be triggered by adding more mass to a white dwarf and causing it to contract is uh, offset by a new kind of pressure turning on. So let's take a Chandrashekhar mass white dwarf, 1.39999 solar masses. We're going to throw the last podcaster onto it, and we're going to have that podcaster fall onto the surface of it. Gravity of the star is now sufficiently powerful that it can overcome the electron pressure, and it's going to catastrophically contract. And in doing so, those electron energies are still going to be driven to higher energies because the density is going up. The electron energies eventually are so high that it is energetically favorable for them to be captured by the protons to make neutrons and neutrinos. So this is exactly what happens inside of a core collapse supernova when a massive star dies, is the core exceeds the Chandrashekhar limit for iron, which is a little bit less than 1.4 because iron is different than carbon and oxygen. And it catastrophically converts the nuclei in the core into this soup of mostly neutrons with a few protons and electrons still thrown in. So the difference in density is basically dominated by the fact that nuclei are now all touching. So do you know this, this fun fact? Should I go through this about how matter is mostly empty space and most of the mass of an atom is in the nucleus? Yes, please. Or is this something we should take for granted? No, go for it. Okay, so I guess I just did it though, right? <laughs> Most of the matter in an atom is in the nucleus. So think about how far one nucleus is from another nucleus if you were a little atomic scale creature. An atom is about 100,000 times bigger than a nucleus, the electron cloud that surrounds the nucleus, which means that nuclei are actually these, these really isolated little droplets of high-density material separated by this vast gulf of space filled by the, the electron wave functions. If you collapse a star, for example, in a core collapse supernova, you are taking these nuclei, these droplets of very high density matter, and you are packing them all together. So this is the density increasing. The density increases by factors of about 10 to the 14, which is like a hundred trillion times. And so this makes something that's like a giant nucleus where all of these neutrons are packed together like it's at nuclear densities, and you get something that is recognized as a neutron star. Now, what is the layers of the neutron star? So unpeel the onion here, and now obviously we couldn't even get near one, especially <laughs> especially one that's really magnetic. You don't want to go near that. But say we could, say we were immune, and we, we drilled into the neutron star, what layers would we see? Yeah, so let's do that exact same exercise. Take your podcaster, throw them out of your spaceship, and let them skydive onto a neutron star. So it's going to start the same way as the white dwarf does, is you're going to see vacuum of space, which is going to give way to a very sparse atmosphere, which is in the span of tens of meters going to turn into something that looks like the core of a white dwarf. It's going to go up many orders of magnitude and density very rapidly. You find something that's kind of like a surface, if it's hot enough, it's sort of liquid, just like the outer layers of the white dwarf is, but you very quickly encounter the crust. The pressure is so high that that material that forms in a white dwarf core is actually present as a crust or as an outer layer, the outermost kilometer of a neutron star. So to give you some context, you know, a neutron star is about 12 kilometers in diameter, you know, about the size of Manhattan. So if you were to move through one of these in the span of a kilometer, you go from the vacuum of space through a crystal 
that crystal is being compressed by all of the weight above it. So it spans factors of millions or billions in density. And when you're at the very bottom of that crust, nuclei have been compressed to such high density that they are touching. And at that point, you are then in the core of the neutron star where you have this kind of fluid of all of these neutrons that are touching each other. But above that, it actually is made of conventional nuclei, just like a white dwarf. Now, when you start tweaking this, some have said that hmm, hypothetically, maybe you could have another state beyond this, a quark star. What's your view on that? Yeah, I I love this. I think that this is one of the biggest open questions in neutron star astrophysics right now. The error bars on measured neutron star radii are still about 10 to 20 percent. And as a result, it's really hard to say exactly how big any neutron stars are. Knowing the size of a neutron star will tell us how squishy they are. Again, think of like a foam ball versus a baseball. If you squeeze on them, how much do they shrink? So how stiff are they? How soft are they? And we don't know exactly how stiff or how soft the material in a neutron star is. So making precision measurements of neutron star radii are actually going to tell us what's deep in the cores of neutron stars. And presently, this is an open question. It is possible that they, in, in they meaning the neutrons, dissolve into a sort of quarky bath. It's possible that strange quarks become made, that there's a phase transition, in this case, like a nuclear phase transition, where many of the down quarks are converted into strange quarks to better partition the energy. But this is an open question. This is unsolved, but I am optimistic that if you get me back on your show in 2034, I might actually be able to give you a, a more clear answer than that. It'd be interesting if you could observe one, because if you're looking at a neutron stars, we can detect those through various means. But can we detect a quark star? Would you like to know more about that? I can tell you how we might do that. Absolutely. Do it. So this this story that I told you about throwing mass onto a neutron star and throwing mass onto a white dwarf makes them contract. The more massive ones have smaller radii. Precision measurements of the radius will probe the deep core. And when we have many of them, we might be able to see evidence for this phase transition. So just like throwing the last podcaster onto a white dwarf would make it collapse, throwing the last podcaster onto a neutron star might trigger a transition of the core material. If the density gets too high, it might reach this threshold for converting a very large amount of neutron star interior into quark matter. So if you observe two neutron stars with the exact same mass, but vastly different radii, the interpretation would be that one of them was one podcaster heavier, and then the pressure in the core was enough to catalyze the creation of one of these exotic phases. So this is, again, part of the reason we spend so much time and energy thinking about the masses and radii of these objects. It's not just trying to have the high score and put out a press release that says, new most massive neutron star found. It's actually about understanding the fundamental physics of nuclear matter at high densities. Now, I wish to be the second to last podcaster, not the last one, because I don't want to go through all of this. I would want to see it, too. But as the second to last podcaster, I get thrown into the black hole. So there is a limit, again, a degeneracy limit where once you pass it, it collapses again into a black hole. Now, my non-standard question here is, could there be a further limit inside a black hole that prevents a singularity? Yeah, this is uh, different from my area. So what you're asking about is a general relativity question, maybe a fundamental particle physics question. And I am not that flavor of physicist. I am a high energy density material scientist. So I am preoccupied with these things that are in some sense conventional plasmas. I think that the nature of singularities is a big mystery that's better left to the Kip Thorns and the Stephen Hawkings of the world. So I have maybe an agnostic take on this. But the, the textbook answer is that singularities are predicted by general relativity, but singularities are divide by zero errors. So there's no reason to really take general relativity at face value when general relativity you know, gives you these mathematical solutions. It's where the theory breaks. So I think it's kind of obvious that there has to be some other physics that describes that point. But all of the other physics that we have describes the exterior of the black hole perfectly well. So any new physics we discover has to sort of contain general relativity or give it back to us at a limit. But I think singularities in general relativity are, again, one of the big open questions in fundamental physics. Now back to a neutron star. 
and these things, you know, magnetars, we're, we're talking about magnetic objects here, that does that magnetic profile, if you can even detect it, you know, how you detect it, whatever, if you can observe it, does that give you clues as to what the interior of the neutron star is like? A little bit. Magnetic fields to an astrophysicist are very different than magnetic fields to most people. I think most people think of magnetic fields as here's this little bar magnet and here's the lines around it and the iron filings line up. To to us, it's more of like a fluid made out of iron girders. And when you thread a magnetic field through a plasma, which a neutron star is made of, it becomes very hard to move that plasma. So magnetic fields have a tendency to lock matter in place. It's very hard to bend a magnetic field, and it's very hard for charged particles to move across magnetic field lines. They can travel along them, but if they try to move at a right angle to them, they get bent back in a circle by the, the Lorentz force. So magnetic fields end up pinning a lot of matter in place. So very strong magnetic fields erupting off axis from a neutron star, like say in a pulsar, can result in some really interesting physics. They can potentially build mountains in the crust by pinning matter in place. And they could even be these things that are like magnetic funnels where material that's falling from the interstellar medium onto the neutron star arrives and creates hotspots. So yeah, magnetic fields end up having really important connections to the neutron star interior. Now, and you're probably gonna know where I'm going with this, but can a neutron star violate its layers? In other words, is it forced into just shells or can material sort of spaghetti up out of certain layers and become something akin to nuclear pasta? And why is that material the strongest in the universe? Ah, okay, so, so you're asking me either how nuclear pasta works and what that even means, or you're asking me if we can get these materials out of the crust. And I think these are two different questions. Let's take them as two different questions. Okay. The first one is just tell us what it is. Okay, so what's nuclear pasta? It's what I did my PhD on. <laughs> the story that I told you about nuclei getting closer and closer together as the density increases is true, but it's incomplete. When the nuclei are really close together, and I mean that like the neighboring nuclei is about as far away as a single nucleus is wide. I think like imagine holding your fists out in front of you with a fist width between them, like so you could hold your phone between them. Imagine that as, as one nucleus and another nucleus. That is a trillion times denser than anything you would find on Earth. But that is the deepest, deepest layers of the neutron star crust right before all of the nuclei are smushed together and become the core. So in these really innermost layers, it's probably only a hundred to a few hundred meters thick, the nuclei actually completely rearrange into a different kind of material. So it's actually energetically favorable for the protons and neutrons to form really large sheets or cylinders or these sort of blobs with, with some voids in them because of the interaction between the protons and neutrons. The protons and neutrons feel a very, very strong, and I mean this literally, the strong force, they feel a strong attraction to each other on the short range, just like nuclei are held together by the strong force on Earth. But there's an electric repulsion that's also getting comparably strong because now you have protons that are nuclear separations from each other, and those repel and push back and stop it all from just glomming together into a big gummy soup. And so they form this balance where you end up with these sheets that contain potentially millions of nucleons that are of order the thickness of like a uranium nucleus. And so because you have these sheets, we call them nuclear pasta because they look like lasagna or spaghetti. Some guys called it that in the 80s and the name just stuck. And so this is the densest layer in the neutron star, and it's the deepest layer in the crust. So for example, if you thread a magnetic field through it, it might be possible to make a very, very massive mountain range buried deep inside a neutron star. To the second part of the question, it doesn't seem to me that if you were to remove this material or any material from a neutron star, it would be for, I guess the correct term would be metastable. It's probably not going to be. So if you, you'd probably, it would probably explode if you removed it. So you could never actually access it. Or am I wrong? No, you've completely got it. So this material is only present because it's under enormous, enormous pressure. And if you removed it from 
the star, then you have removed that gravitational pressure and the compression on it. And all of that energy that's stored in its internal pressure from the degeneracy of the neutrons and the degeneracy of electrons will cause it to expand and fragment and eventually form heavy elements. Coincidentally, this is actually really important for producing heavy elements. If you take two neutron stars, have them emit gravitational waves and crash into each other, that collision rips off a really large fraction of the neutron star crust and the nuclear pasta layer, and even some of the slightly deeper matter. And this matter then decompresses, and because it's so neutron rich, it's capable of forming all of the heavy nuclei on the periodic table past the iron peak. So all of the actinides, for example, uranium, thorium, gold, these elements, most of them were formed in neutron star mergers by this high density matter, including some nuclear pasta disintegrating and returning to its its regular state that we're familiar with. And what's fun about that is we've seen it, the kilonova, and off, out comes gold and silver and everything from these neutron star mergers. And we can actually see that, right? Yeah, the the, the big event was GW170817. So that's named for the date that was 2017, August 17th, where LIGO, the Gravitational Wave Observatory, triggered on one of these these merger events from the gravitational waves of them spiraling in. And every astronomer on the planet got a text message saying, hey, we saw gravitational waves and it's consistent with neutron stars. And then they got a text message that says, hey, we saw a gamma ray burst consistent with a short gamma ray burst, which is like a jet that gets shot out when, when these things uh, collapse to a black hole. So every astronomer on the planet basically knew immediately that a neutron star merger had gone off. They knew where to point their telescopes. And within a couple of hours, the galaxy that it was in was found and this explosion was studied. And it's probably the most well-characterized single explosion in history just because of the thousands of hours of telescope time that were spent staring at it over months. So how common is it? So, all right, so you've got several ways to make heavier elements. You've got a supernova that can populate a galaxy with, with heavier materials. But let's take uranium. Earth has uranium. What are the chances it came from a kilonova, a neutron star merger versus a supernova? Or is it just no way to know? I'd, I'd put it at almost certain. I'd say that the, the maybe this is a little bit of opinion and a little bit of my personal professional bias, but I think the other explanations have really fallen on the wayside. For a long time, I think, I mean, we'll say the 1970s and 80s, the like Carl Sagan era, it was, it was known, it was taught that supernova produce all of these heavy elements. And then we realized from 20, 30 years of simulations that core collapse supernova don't actually let out a lot of that neutron rich material that forms right at the surface of that neutron star that's in the core. And that's because the escape velocity there is like half the speed of light and there's a lot of material falling in on top of it. So it's really hard to get the neutron rich matter out. And there's lots of neutrinos which also tend to make the, the supernova have more protons than neutrons. So it's harder to make those really neutron rich nuclei. So at this point, barring a special supernova that form these interesting jets that might let some of this material out, it seems likely that neutron star mergers are probably the dominant source of some of these heavy elements. And that's subject to change in future years as our simulations improve and as we observe more and we eventually, you know, we'll observe a population of neutron star mergers. But for now, I'm pretty confident that neutron star mergers are one of the, or if not the main source of these heavy elements. So what is the mass range of neutron stars? In other words, can you have two low mass neutron stars that are more massive than white dwarfs and they are neutron stars and that they merge and become a bigger neutron star or do they always collapse into black holes? This is again, one of the big open questions. So I mentioned this earlier that the maximum mass of neutron stars is really important because it tells us how stiff the matter in the star is. And it tells us about the fundamental nature of high density matter, whether you get these strange quark phases or not. So astronomers that go searching for really massive neutron stars are doing so for that reason. And every year or two, this limit has then been pushed up by another tenth of a solar mass. So within the past few years, we've observed a handful of neutron stars all right at about two solar masses. And we haven't really broken this record by a huge factor since then. So right now we seem to be converging on roughly two solar masses, maybe a little bit more as the absolute upper limit for a, for a neutron star. And so it's entirely possible that if two neutron stars merge and they are both really low mass neutron stars, 
that you can potentially shed enough matter that you can have a long-lived hypermassive neutron star right at this two solar mass limit. The 170817 merger neutron star, the simulations of this actually suggest that the two neutron stars didn't produce a black hole right away, but there was actually a hypermassive neutron star that stuck around for a little bit before collapsing into a black hole. So these are really three different possible outcomes. This is not fully understood. Different mergers with different mass ratios of neutron stars could be making different things. This can affect the explosion dynamics and affect the yield of the heavy elements because an asymmetric merger will be ripping matter from different depths and different parts of the star. So I'm just sort of saying all of this to emphasize that neutron star mergers, while we have this big picture now, they are not a solved problem by any means. You can still go and get a PhD on what would seem like very simple, straightforward questions. Well, it always gets more complicated the more you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, that's what's happening is that, you know, in science, you know, Answering questions creates more questions. Always. In this case, you know what would be really interesting? And you know somewhere in the universe, probably not very commonly, but somewhere in the universe, two neutron stars collapsed and left behind a quark star. <laughs> Wouldn't that be exciting? I would love to see one of those before I die. That would be really nice to just know if they exist or not. Probably going to need life extension technology for that one and live for a few thousand years, which I'm hoping to do. Or, or you just find two neutron stars with almost the same mass and completely different radii. Yeah. I guess you could, couldn't you? Mm hmm. That would be the smoking gun that one of these neutron stars actually has a secret quark core. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Now, so getting into crystalline, that 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 infamous word in our conversation here. So would the quarks and a quark star do the same thing? I guess they would, wouldn't they? It would be crystalline in the same way, maybe? Uh, I actually don't know. This is something that people debate. There's this phase of quark matter that's called color flavor locked. And it's really a question about whether or not these materials will flow, if they'll resist a shear stress or if they'll move when subjected to a shear stress. And this depends on a lot of uncertain physics. And you ask 10 different theorists what could be at the center of a neutron star, and you're going to get 20 different answers. So I think it really depends exactly on what specific pieces of physics you want to use to construct your theory of the next dense piece of matter. 20 different answers from 20 different people. Sounds like tax preparers. Now, two black holes, and there really are, they're very situational, just like everything else, in that you can have core collapse black holes and and as we as we used to see them, but also primordial black holes. And primordial black holes are a candidate to make up the mass that we need to account for dark matter, whatever it is, as an alternative to a weakly interacting particle flying around. Instead, we're just looking at primordial black holes everywhere and they are gonna hit stuff. Tell me about that. Oh, you read my other paper. Oh boy. Okay, so so what's a primordial black hole? A collapse at the early stages of the universe near the time of the Big Bang where materials could collapse, but they're lower mass. In other words, much, much smaller black holes could be formed than what happens today. You got it, man. Yeah, it's it's this funny thing that, that never gets communicated is that supernova make these dense pockets of matter, but that's only one way to make a black hole. You just need dense matter, and the early universe was full of dense matter everywhere. So it's entirely possible that there's kajillions, again, a made-up number, kajillions of black holes that formed at early times. So we don't know if this happened or not. Maybe the supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies are primordial black holes, maybe not. But going the other direction, maybe there's lots of really low-mass primordial black holes that have masses comparable to asteroids, and these would have shore shield radii, their event horizon would only be about an angstrom in size. And believe it or not, there isn't evidence contradicting this. A lot of astrophysics is done on a ruling it out basis or on a ways not to build a light bulb kind of argument. So you say, well, if this dark matter thing existed, it would have this effect on globular clusters or this effect on galactic structure. And because we don't observe it, proof by contradiction, that doesn't exist. But angstrom scale black holes produced in the first seconds of the universe are really hard to study this way. So it's entirely possible, like you said, that dark matter is actually made of super duper abundant tiny black holes from the early universe that are whizzing through the galaxy and by extension whizzing through the solar system. The idea of 
a black hole whizzing through the solar system. And, and I will point out, too, that one of the hypotheses regarding the Planet Nine, the effects that we see, Planet Nine might yep. actually be a primordial black hole in orbit of the sun. But if they're whizzing through the, the uh, solar system, I can't think of a greater opportunity for physics than to go look at one. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, you would have a black hole right there. You don't have to create it in the accelerator or anything like that. You just, it's right there. So what would these do if one hit Earth right now? What would happen? Oh, it wouldn't be all that dramatic. I think everyone watches too many Marvel movies because if I asked you to tell me what you think happens, would you tell me that, oh, the Earth gets gobbled up and then we all die and then and then it like collapses like, like a you know little CGI sequence, right? Like that's the obvious answer. Yeah, but right? but it doesn't have the mass. Yeah, yeah, and it's completely wrong, right? It doesn't have the mass to do it though. It doesn't. It can't. It doesn't have the material. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's actually. It's it's not just about the mass. It's about the speed. So think about escape velocity. If you drop something from infinitely high up, it accelerates up to the escape velocity when it reaches the surface. That's just conservation of energy. So something that's coming from the galaxy is already traveling 200 kilometers a second just because it's orbiting the galaxy. The sun is moving 200 kilometers around the galaxy, for example. So if you throw one of these black holes at the Earth whose escape velocity is like 11 kilometers a second, you're pretty much guaranteed that it's going to enter the Earth going far faster than escape velocity. It can only eat a couple of tons of matter during the transit. And that sounds like a lot, but it's really not all that much in the grand scheme of things. And so it's just going to pass through the other side. It's going to have barely grown in mass. It's going to have barely slowed down. And it's just going to shoot back off into space, minding its own business for the rest of forever and completely forget about this little quick transit when it punched through the Earth. So really, it's it's not like settling into the core of the earth and eating it. It's like a bullet through cotton candy. It's so fast and so dense that it doesn't even slow down. Now, as you get bigger, if it hit the sun, would the sun slow it down? Yeah, even then, this wouldn't stop a primordial black hole. So one of these proofs by contradiction that I mentioned is that people have done calculations of how big does the primordial black hole need to be in order to be stopped, for example, by a neutron star or a white dwarf. And this is well above the asteroid mass range. This is pushing into like Earth mass primordial black holes. So one proof that we have that there aren't lots and lots of these more massive primordial black holes is the continued existence of neutron stars and white dwarfs in the galactic center, as one example. But at this really small angstrom scale, they can punch through pretty much anything and they're not going to slow down. But there is a limit. You can't do it with a bu another black hole, right? So if a uh, primordial black hole is cooking along and it hits Sagittarius A star, it's not coming back out. Oh, it's going to get eaten. That would be really exciting if there was a clear way to detect gravitational waves from that. But I do think that those masses are still just a little bit too small. Well, I would wonder about something, actually, because if you, if you had a primordial black hole at enormous speed going directly at a black hole with a huge accretion disk, maybe you might get some x-rays or something off of the, as it passes through the accretion disk. I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It would depend definitely on the mass of the black hole, the secondary, not the primary. But at that point, if you already have the primary that it's accreting from, that could just be easily lost in the noise of regular flaring activity from, from dead disks are notoriously violent and, and very bright to begin with. It's needle in a haystack to see something like that. All right, so we have a gigantic historic record staring us right in the face in the form of the surface of the moon. Would a primordial black hole impact and passing through the moon like a, like a bullet, would that leave any evidence on the surface of the moon as a kind of weird crater? Oh, I should hope so because I have written papers about this. So black holes aren't just black. I think this is, again, one of these other talking points that we have failed as an astrophysics community. Black holes are some of the brightest things in the universe, so long as they have an accretion disk. If you throw matter at a black hole, well, it's going to fall in at most of the speed of light, and things going most of the speed of light, bumping into other things as they spiral down that drain, are going to get really hot, and they're going to release a lot of energy. So this is true whether or not you're Sagittarius A star in the center of the galaxy. It's true if you're a stellar mass black hole eating a stellar companion. And I think it would be true if it is a tiny angstrom scale primordial black hole that has gone from the vacuum of space to suddenly being inside the moon a second later. So we wrote this paper, it's a hydrodynamic paper, where we do simulations 
of asteroids and primordial black holes hitting basically a sheet of rock. And so the core idea that comes out of this is that an asteroid impact, that is a point explosion. That's like putting a pile of TNT on the surface of of the moon and then setting it off. It makes a nice round spherical explosion and it sends debris out at all angles that settles around it, making that characteristic ejecta blanket that surrounds that nice basin that we're all used to seeing. A primordial black hole is going to be completely different because it's not going to slow down. So as the black hole passes through the moon, matter is going to be accreted. And as the matter is accreted, it's going to get hot. And that heat in the X-rays and the high energy photons that are coming off of this tiny accretion disk around this little black hole will push back against a column of matter. So instead of having all of your TNT piled up in a big mountain on the surface that you're going to blow up, it's like digging a borehole straight down and filling that with explosives and setting that thing off. So after this transit has ended, of course, this doesn't leave a tunnel through to China. The high pressures of all of the rock around it do flow back in and fill this thing. So on the surface, you end up with a basin that's relatively similar to a traditional impact. But because this is like a column of matter that's exploding, a lot more matter gets shot up, like it's being launched out of a potato cannon rather than sideways. And so the debris field around these craters is going to be much steeper. You end up with a what's called the ejecta blanket. It's the thing that's beyond the basin. Ends up having much steeper slopes to it because less matter was shot radially sideways and outward, more of it was shot upward. So in principle, if you had a really, really high resolution scan of the surface of the moon, you could search for craters that could not possibly have been made by traditional impacts. And that day is coming, right? In other words, with all of our renewed interest in lunar exploration, surveying like that is going to be done. So by 2050, you might have an answer for this, right? Yeah, I do really hope so. We use the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter data just as a proof of concept. And The LRO is a fantastic machine. Like we have maps of the moon. It is a crazy time to be alive. But these maps are sort of 65 meters per pixel. So when you think of it that way, I need craters that are bigger than a football stadium in order to just get them to appear over more than two or three pixels. And that's not quite enough. I think that that these black holes are going to be producing craters that are between meters and tens of meters. So these are just easily lost in the noise of the present data. But next generation detectors, next generation surface scans, it might be possible to to do a dedicated search for these, especially with advances in machine learning. We already did it as a proof of concept. And of course, all of our hits were spurious. You know, there's no way to actually follow up on these at the like one pixel level. But next generation surface scans might actually show us something. You know, it'd be interesting to see what it does to the geology, because just the geology of, a, of an actual standard impact crater of it just hitting and compressing and then rebounding, it seems to me it would be very different for this. <laughs> yeah, I would love to find an actual geologist to work through this with me in, in some detail. You know, our simulations were very cursory. One of the other neat things that comes out of this is even if a second collision comes along later and sort of wipes out my first crater, because it's a transit, you do get a crater on the opposite side, right? So every time that a tiny PBH hits the moon, you get two craters out of it and you have a column of shocked matter, probably high density phases of quartz that were created by the heat. Think how diamonds are made in the earth an analog process would be happening on the moon. These things would have columns of matter that have this this high density sort of metamorphic phases and they would point to each other. So this isn't just idle speculation. It kind of is. But you can, in principle, use these things to say, hey, this is definitely a weird crater because these two things point to each other. That's that's a smoking gun that, that something exotic happened. And it's not just a crazy theoretical physicist saying, I think this crater was made by a black hole. I think it's absolutely amazing that if we were to find such a crater, which is that's within our lifetime here, and if we were to find such a crater, but not know, not find a primordial black hole, we would just simply know that they're out there and they hit planets. Yeah. (laughs) And that's 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 enough to be spooky, if not dangerous. Yeah. It would be awesome. I was told when I was young and impressionable that every astrophysicist needs to have their own transient and they need to have their own dark matter candidate. So you need to have your own explosion and you need to have your own dark matter thing. And the spirit of that was you should allow yourself to be creative and think about problems that you otherwise wouldn't normally because solving the big questions is often a 
Edison activity of finding 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. And when you fail to not make a light bulb, it's because you've succeeded in making a light bulb. And that's how we're going to solve dark matter. Most of the things that we do now are trying to rule out these dark matter candidates. But when you fail to rule one out, that means that it's correct. And so this is my little contribution to dark matter science, despite really being a high energy density, white dwarf neutron star interior theorist. All right, Matt, thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to your next paper. Maybe we can do it again. Yeah, I will let you know when that's out. <laughs>